Hi, and thank you for tuning in to today's Draw With Me video. Don't worry, I'm going to pull out my sketchbook in just a moment and start drawing. In fact, maybe you can just skip ahead to the drawing segment of the video because that's where we get a little bit more podcasty and less life updatey. But I felt like I should come on camera just a little bit to say hi and check in. It's been a while since I did a one-on-one -on -one video kind of talking about what's new with me. I know the last video I published was an interview with Jordan Lozada, who has also survived the Nityananda cult and gone on to do just incredible things with his life. He is a prime example of somebody who heals from cult indoctrination and then thrives. And the reason I wanted to kind of touch base with you guys a bit and just talk about life in general is that you have seen so many different phases in my life. If you're a long time viewer or one of my OG subscribers, like if you've been here since 2011 when I started my channel, you've seen me go from a professional tarot card reader who was passionate about Arcturians and starseed topics and meditation all the way into being fully brainwashed by a fraud cult leader from India who is now a criminal on the run. You've seen me be defensive of said cult leader and then you've seen me leave his cult and start speaking out against the atrocities he committed. So you've seen like quite a wide variety of stuff on my channel. You've seen me talk about veganism. I mean, if you're new here, hi, my name is Sarah. And no, I don't think that you personally have seen all this stuff about me. What I mean is in general, whatever I'm going through and whatever I'm believing in at any given time, I just have a tendency to overshare. Like I will tell you everything about everything that I'm doing and why and how it feels and what I'm planning to do next. And so because of that, I think it's part of my Sagittarian fire energy where we have this truthfulness about us, where we feel like we have to be open books. We can't just keep anything back or leave anything unsaid. But because of that, I've noticed a lot of people get confused about what's my truth, what's my reality, what's my perception of self, because I have gone kind of all over the place. And so what I want to share with you today is that I now feel like it is the right time for me to get back to my roots, spiritually speaking. And no, I'm not talking about my early childhood Catholicism that I was born into. I'm talking about the meditative aspects of myself, the spiritual but not religious, the awakened to divine messages and receptive to receive them without being conditioned based on any external influence. Yes, I'm talking about getting back into tarot reading. Some of you have been asking for this over the years if I'm ever going to start offering readings again. Stay tuned. That will be available very, very soon. I'm just waiting for one deck that I have to replace. I had a deck that I used to work with that was one of my absolute favorites to set the foundation for a reading. I lost it among my years of traveling to and from India and when I made this decision to get back into reading tarot cards, it shocked me to discover that that favorite oracle deck of mine is now discontinued. It's out of print. It was called the Crystal Ally Cards and it was created by Nasha Asian, the co-author of the Book of Stones. but. Then I discovered something really, really exciting, and that's that she has released an updated version of that deck. It has more cards than it used to have and a higher frequency, fifth dimensional energy vibe to it. So it's kind of like 
by getting back into readings at this point in time, after that update of her deck, I know I'm not just going back a step or regressing to what I was before going through this weird convoluted life journey that's brought me to where I am. It's like a step forward. And this is something that I just wanted to kind of talk out with you, and I'm sure you can relate to this, which is that sometimes you have a passion in life. And for whatever reason, whether it's a relationship or going to school or getting a practical job and discovering adult responsibilities and having to do some adulting for a while, you get sidetracked and taken away from that true passion of yours. And there's always a part of you in the back of your mind thinking, remember when I used to do that really creative, fun thing just for myself? Whether it's drawing or making music or playing sports or writing or whatever else it might be doing makeup, I'll tell you guys like, I don't do this look to attract anybody. I do this look because it's so much freaking fun to play with colors and to play with my face and to just experiment with my eyeshadow. Um, whatever passion you may have, like whatever fun thing you might do, sometimes life takes you away from it. And for a temporary period of time, you feel like you have to put your focus on something else instead. And at the back of your mind, like I was saying, part of you is always thinking, remember how great it used to be when I would lose myself in joy of reading, writing, drawing, painting, <laughs> dancing, you name it. And there's almost like a yearning or you're missing your real self. I'll tell you, one of the things I experienced in the cult that for me, it was so different than anything I'd ever experienced before was a complete change of identity. And I'm not talking like my beliefs evolved or my feelings changed. I'm talking like a completely different persona was imposed on me externally and I had to be that. You know when you love somebody a lot and you miss them and you can't see them as often as you want to, maybe they're long distance, and you just have this yearning to reconnect with them and whoever else is around you, you can appreciate their company, but you really wish you were with that one special somebody. I mean, I don't mean to sound self-absorbed or self-centered, but for me, that person I was missing in the cult was my actual self. And the reason I want to share this is that I just watched a really cool eight-part course on Udemy presented by Dr. Stephen Hassan, in which he broke down the bite model, the behavior, information, like it, all the different aspects of control that cults will put on you. In fact, maybe I'll do a whole video just about the bite model and what I understood from that Udemy course as it applies to the cult of the fraud who calls himself Nityananda. I think that could be kind of helpful for others like me who are coming out of that mind control from his cult. But anyway, one of the things that fraudulent cult leader told me was not to read tarot cards and it's not because he had anything against psychic ability or spiritual divination or oracular intuition. It's that it wasn't Vedic. He told me, learn Vedic astrology instead. If you want to give readings, give Hindu philosophy readings. And I see you, people in the comment section, saying there's no such thing as Hinduism. It's Sanatana Dharma. And the word Hindu comes from the fact that when Westerners discovered India. Those are the people who were living in the Indus Valley region. So yeah, I know Hindu is not an authentic word as per sacred Sanskrit or your spiritual text. I'm only using that word because it's the word most people are comfortable with when it comes to the pantheon of deities 
embodying the Hindu spiritual tradition. So when I use that word, please don't take offense and think I'm generalizing Hindus. I, I understand the spiritual tradition goes so far beyond any singular word that could be given to it. Sanatana Dharma, like that eternal way of enlightenment and realization and self-perfection and coming into oneness with the highest energy. Like, okay, that that is still the spiritual tradition that has my heart. Like, that is still my top love as far as religions are concerned. Because to me, Sanatana Dharma is not a religion. It's like a lifestyle. The, the pure sattvic vegetarianism, I'm vegan. And so for me, with my love for animals and my recognition for consciousness pervading all, it's a, it's a no-brainer that among all the world's traditions, the one I feel the most at one with is the one that recognizes the value and the intrinsic consciousness residing within our non-human animal friends. So yeah, anyhow, back to what I was saying. That fraudulent cult leader, he told me, don't read tarot cards because they're not Hindu. Don't wear Western clothing. Don't wear gemstones or try to do any crystal healing. Instead, learn all about all the different kinds of rudrakshas. And don't get me wrong, I freaking love Vedic astrology. I love astrology in general. I think it's fascinating. However, my brain is not really wired for mathematic precision or calculation. We're each different. And so those who are astrologers out there, I value the wisdom that you share. I value how you're able to chart the stars and map the courses of people's lives. I have had astrology readings and they always resonate. But my path leads more towards the messages that come through more like channeling. I'm not so much about calculations and precision. I'm more about going into that state of meditative awareness and just allowing whatever wants to come through to come through. And for me, the particular format that this intuition thrives with, what resonates with me the most is reading cards. Maybe I'll talk about that as I draw today. So I'm going to kind of put that on hold for a second and get back once again to the point I was just making, which is that one of the things that happened to me in that cult, and if you've ever been in a highly controlling group, maybe a work environment where you have to pretend to be somebody else while you're on the sales floor or in the office or among colleagues. If you've ever been in a family structure where you're told not to joke around too much or not to be yourself or to dress differently, like if you have ever been in a situation in your life where you felt the need to censor your expression, and not pursue your passions, instead to do what you think or what you're told is the right thing to do, even though to you it feels wrong, you'll understand what I'm talking about here. In that cult, I was given a new name, I was only allowed to wear orange, I was, I had to have dreadlocks, and I mean, yeah, dreads are awesome. I fr They are gorgeous. I love them. I, I actually enjoyed kind of the fashion angle, the piercings and the matted locks. I don't like to use the word dread because there's nothing dreadful about them. But there were times when I felt this deep missing for the life I had created for myself before I joined that cult. I really missed having a long, lazy morning, my favorite kind of morning routine, and I do this really ritualistically, is to get up, do some stretches, not a full-on yoga session, but just enough to get my body feeling kind of limber and relaxed. I make myself some coffee, and then I just like to sit down 
watch the clouds, look out the window, maybe make some beaded jewelry and slowly sip my coffee to energize myself while I plan my day. Whereas in that cult, from the moment we woke up in the morning, it was work time. Like we had to be on the ball. We had to run to the hall to do a one hour yoga session, then run back and take a cold water bath then get dressed and run back and worship a man on a stage for an hour, worship his feet, Pratyaksha Pada Puja. Then we had to listen to an hour of his indoctrinating discourses and then for the rest of the day, which went on until about three o'clock in the morning, we had to do whatever work he told us to do. And what I found for not only myself, but for everyone there, is that as soon as he knew kind of what you were into, what you were about, he would give you work that went against your nature. So for me, for example, I'm kind of a loner. I like my personal space. I like my personal time. I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert. Although I can go on camera and talk to you like this, I haven't always been that way. I have been a very reserved person, very shy. I like to keep to myself. And so when I joined that cult, it was in 2015 at the end of a program I attended in Varanasi, on the very last day of that program, the cult leader invited whoever wants to share their experience to go on stage and speak. Well, I had a fear of public speaking, so I didn't sign up for that. It was optional, but of course, I was called and told that he was requesting me specifically to go on stage and talk. Now, as much as I would like to say that was rude to pull me out of my comfort zone, there are things I experienced in that place that contributed positively to who I am. I don't want to make videos only talking about all the shit and all the negatives in that cult because then I get comments like, well, why did you stay? You know, why didn't you leave? There were things that kind of broke me out of my comfort zone that I appreciated, like my fear of being on camera was completely broken. Talk to my mom if you don't believe me. Like when I was a kid, if somebody brought a video camera over to my grandma's house on Christmas, I would run and hide in the bathroom. I would never let myself get filmed. I didn't even like having my picture taken, let alone snapping a selfie and post it on Instagram. So he kind of broke that fear of exposing myself. He broke that fear of public speaking. And that's something, I don't want to say I'm grateful to him for doing it, but I'm grateful that that experience happened in my life. I enjoyed all of the temples. I enjoyed learning about Sanatana Dharma. And so when the negative things come in, like the behavior control, like the restrictions where we weren't allowed to listen to his critics or to hear out the victims who had been raped by him in the past when they were speaking out, when all of these external oppressions were being forced on us and holding us down, the reason I would put up with them was that I was clinging to the few positive things that happened. I was thinking like, well, if he's really as bad as his critics are saying, why do I now have the courage and the confidence to speak on stage? He blessed me with that. He gifted this to me. Or, you know, if I, I would read about cults, especially towards the end of my time there, I had binge watched Leah Remini's Scientology in the Aftermath on A&E, and she would describe the morning routine, literally what we were living as our morning routine in that place. She would describe that as priming somebody to be brainwashed. She said if somebody was sleep deprived, if they were put into a position where they had to do physical work early in the morning, a lot of rhythmic repetition, which is exactly what the puja was, repeating the same words over and over along with hand gestures that accompanied them. And that once somebody was sleep deprived, then forced to be physically active on an empty stomach after some chanting, repetition, meditation, 
whatever is told to them, they won't be able to question the information. Their critical thinking skills will be turned off. And so after getting like less than two hours of sleep a night, and then doing one hour of intensive yoga, and then another hour of repetition, chanting, meditating, when we then had to sit and listen to the cult leader's discourse, that was when the brainwashing was happening. And the shit he was telling us was stuff like, you cannot be violated. Anybody you perceive as violating you, you have already given your unconscious permission to them to violate you. And so how was that dangerous when it came to our loss of identity and our dissolution into the Borg? I mean, the Sangha? It was that when he then violated us, we would never see it as a violation because we saw ourselves as people who could not be violated. And so when he sexually abused us, when he yelled at us, when he berated us publicly, when he shamed us, when he ridiculed us, when he sleep deprived us, when he wouldn't let us eat, when things like that were done, instead of seeing, hey, this person is going past what they're permitted to do, you know, they're violating me, they are hurting me, they're victimizing me. Instead, we thought, well, victim mentality is stupid. I'm not a victim, therefore he is not abusing me. I cannot be violated, therefore he has not violated me. There were so many restrictions put onto our brains literally turning off our capacity to feel anything wrong had been done to us, that we went along with anything. The reason I want to talk about this a little bit is that I do get people asking, why didn't you leave? Why did you fall for it? How did you allow the sexual abuse to happen and not stop it? I see people asking Jordan those same questions. I see people asking everyone who survived any cult those same questions. And this is why. We went there for one reason. And usually it's a very noble reason. I was attracted to the fact that this cult leader claimed on stage to care about animals and animal welfare. And he told me, verbatim in a Facebook Messenger private message, he said, you can do more towards your goal of making the world vegan as my disciple than you can if you're out there on your own. He had me at that. He had me at, you'll save more animals with me than away from me. For me, that was my goal. I know another girl who her goal was to revive the sacred Sanskrit tradition. She's a beautiful young Indian lady, studied Sanskrit at the university level, would do a lot of translation for him. And he told her, if you go the academic route, or if you get a job working for a company, you will not be reviving the sacred Sanskrit traditions. But if you come here, live with me, be with me, you'll be reviving the Vedas and the Agamas. You'll be living the Agama tradition. And that got her. Whatever somebody really believed in or held as their fundamental core identity, the cult leader would use that and dangle it like a carrot and say, with me, you can achieve the fullness of that goal. Once we got there, however, we were put through the ringer and given all kinds of other tasks that we got so distracted that we forgot what had originally drawn us in in the first place. And then every once in a while, there would be like nostalgic reminiscence about who we were. In my case, whenever I went online, if I saw something about crystal healing or gemstones, I would get this pang of regret that I had lost my business. I had sold my shop to pay for a $10,000 program of his, sorry, $12,000 US dollar program of his. Whenever I saw something about tarot, I would get this unquenchable sadness that, wow, 
I had mastered the art of reading tarot cards and now I'm not allowed to do it anymore because it's not Hindu. There were all kinds of things from having multiple colors instead of just orange and brown all the time. I would really miss my actual self. And what's crazy, well not crazy, it's part of the process of deprogramming from cult indoctrination. I guess I should say what's What's interesting now that I've kind of come through that cycle is that even after I left the Nityananda cult, even after I came back to the Western world and had the freedom to make decisions for my own life once again, I still felt like I no longer had the right to read tarot cards or to tap into my unique intuition or to be the self I genuinely wanted to be. And the reason for that was that I felt so much guilt and shame over the fact that I had been deceived by a fraud. I felt like if my intuition had allowed me to walk into the trap set by an abusive rapist, then how can I ever trust my intuition again? If the tarot cards didn't warn me about that trap I was about to walk into, how can I ever connect with tarot cards again? If the Arcturians and Pleiadians and Ascended Masters and those in the love light vibration didn't have my back as I was going into that cult, how can I call on their energies ever again? It's kind of like because that fraudster had used me as a pawn to recruit people into his cult, I had lost faith in all my spiritual joys. I let myself get back into crystal healing and jewelry making because that was more of a gray area, like crystals and gemstones. You can wear them just for their physical beauty, just for the scientific cool factor, since they have such cool growth formations and you know the, the structures inherent within the crystalline matrix are so geometrically symmetrical and beautiful. They're just, they're cool. I'm going to nerd out here for a second and say geology is awesome. I like rocks. I like pretty crystals and stuff. But when it came to my more hardcore spiritual practices, my personal meditations, when I would go into visionary states and see deities, when I would connect, like I said, through tarot and get these psychic channeled messages, when I would talk to the Arcturians or the Archangels, I felt like all of that had failed me. And for a really long time, like up until even just a few months ago, when people would ask me, are you ever going to do tarot card readings again? I would say no, because I felt like I had led myself into a trap and then kind of waved others like, hey, come on, come to this ashram, come meet this guru, he's awesome. And it had just messed up everybody's life who went there. Finally, I kind of came to the realization around New Year's going from 2020 into 2021, I came to this realization that what I was doing by saying I no longer have the right to read tarot or I no longer feel that connection with the Arcturians. What I was doing was punishing myself. And I kind of started to examine why. Like, I loved giving tarot card readings. Back when I was in that cult, I used to think if I ever get out of this or if I wasn't here, if I wasn't following this leader, what would I be doing instead? I would always think I'd be reading tarot again. I would be spiritual on my own terms once again. I would be connecting with the Arcturians. And so once I finally escaped, why did I feel the need to punish myself by withholding the few spiritual things that get me the most excited? It doesn't make any sense rationally. And then I started to contemplate on why it was that I believed it had been a mistake to go into that cult. You hear me out on this. When, when you do something in life that you don't enjoy 
and then afterwards you make a decision you're never gonna do that again. Was it a mistake to do it or was it a lesson learned that now you'll never fall for again? You'll never fall for that con ever again. And you have the wisdom that comes only from experience to know why it's a dangerous thing, why it's a negative influence, why it's something you've evolved beyond. I started to kind of flip my perspective towards realizing if I hadn't got caught up into that cult, I would still be looking for human beings of a higher spiritual level than me to guide me. I wouldn't be solidly confident and reliant on my own personal joys and pleasures and excitements as the soul factor is dictating my next moves. And this is what I kind of wanted to share with you guys is this aha moment I've had because I think we've all been there. Maybe not in an extremist cult in India, but we've all been there in a position in life where we feel our uniqueness is getting stifled, our excitement is getting repressed, and we have to go through the motions of doing things somebody else dictates towards us because we're creating their dream instead of our own dream. We're fitting within their formula for what life should be instead of our own formula for what we want life to be we are conforming ourselves to their idea of who we should be instead of just being who we are. And I'm telling you, like when you are who you truly are, the right people who enjoy you for who you are, those are the people you're going to attract. Those are the people you're going to connect with. You'll be bringing out the best in them and they will be bringing out the best in you, not from the perspective of, contrived, forced roles that you want the other to play in your life. So you tell them to be that for you or vice versa, but a true melding of energies. And it's something I've just started to discover very, very recently, which is that the more I just decide to do what I love most and to not punish myself for perceived mistakes from the past, but to see it as a lesson that I've moved on from, integrate it as something that I now have wisdom about and keep moving forward. One of the things Dr. Hassan said in that Udemy course was that when he came out of the Moonies cult, he had a conversation with an Ivy League professor of psychology who was interested in researching brainwashing. And that professor said to him, you know, kind of at that pivotal time where he was wondering what to do with his education path, that man said to him that he understands something experientially, that all the psychological experts in that field only understand intellectually. They understand what brainwashing is from having studied prisoners of war who had been captured by the communists and had another identity imposed on them. Whereas somebody like Stephen Hassan, who lived the cult experience and then got out of the cult experience, knows firsthand what it's like to have your very identity taken away from you and replaced by something else that is not you, and then how to come out of it again. And he suggested to Stephen, Dr. Hassan now, that he should make that his point of study, that he should start putting himself into that where he can teach others through his experience what he had gone through. So anyway, it's kind of come to my realization like, aha, this is what I've been waiting for. This realization is what I've been kind of waiting for in order to understand all the bad things that I've experienced in my life are not weights holding me down. There's steps that I'm climbing on top of to work further towards my goals. And that not only will I be good at reading tarot cards again, but in fact, it's a level up. And I'm sharing this because I think of it as something 
not just for me, but for all of us. If you've been caught in any form of guilt or regret or shame because of a mistake that you've made, and now you're ready to go back to what you were doing before, but part of you feels like, well, shit, I had it then. Now, if I have to get it back again, I'll be starting off at a space lower than what I was when I had previously reached my zenith in that. I'm telling you, I can feel the transform transformative energies of the universe right now want you to hear this message. You are not getting back into it lesser than you were when you were in it before. You are getting back into it stronger, more experienced, more wise than you were before. And I mean anything. And say you used to work out all the time and then when the pandemic hit, you retreated and started maybe pigging out a bit and started kind of vegging out and not, not really building your body anymore. If you feel like you want to get fit again, but you've lost it, uh-uh, you didn't lose it. You just experienced what it's like to be demotivated. So when you get your motivation back and you start working out again, you're going to have that much more enthusiasm and that much more of a right to tell other people, hey, if I can do it, so can you. If I let myself go and now I'm getting disciplined again, here's how I did it. There's nothing that we experience in this life that is ever going to stop us from being who we are meant to be. Because if you want to be something, you're meant to be that. If you want to achieve something, you're meant to achieve it. And if you feel like you don't have the right to that thing that you want to be or that thing you want to achieve because of something you've done in your past, feel that weight lifted from your shoulders. Just let it go. Just breathe a sigh of relief and understand there's nothing that you could have possibly done that will stop you from being successful in what you choose to do the moment you choose to do it. And that's what I wanted to share with you as my long winded intro to this video. I used to miss myself back when I had to pretend to be Ma Nitya Swarupa Priyananda. I missed the hell out of Sarah. I missed the tarot reading, spiritual Arcturian energy, goddess consciousness that I used to enjoy expressing. I missed the fun, playful colors, which is why I've got my eye makeup done like this today. I missed being authentic to who I am. And if you feel in any way whatsoever that you're missing who you truly are, then I think you watched this video for a reason. You're meant to get back to yourself once again. And if you don't know what that self actually even is or what you love, just take a moment and ask, if you could do anything for a living, if money was no object and you'd get paid a great living wage and then some, whether you're cleaning the gutters or styling the hair or travel vlogging or doing something psychic or making jewelry or drawing or painting or writing or singing or acting, like if you could do literally anything, and have everything you need provided. Like, I'm not talking about what would you do for clout or what would you do for a big paycheck. I'm saying if you would get whatever you want, no matter what you do, so you can do anything, what would you do? And then that's the passion to focus on. You can probably tell I've been watching quite a bit of Bashar again, so I'm all into follow your passion, follow your joy, follow your bliss, because that's what manifests for you the greatest enthusiasm. Now, Jordan, who I interviewed in my last video, he played a big role in me coming to this new realization, this new awareness. There were conversations that we had that reminded me of how much I love doing tarot. And actually it was his idea. He mentioned to me a few weeks ago, that I should start giving readings again before I ever vocalized to anybody out loud that I was thinking of starting to give readings again. He just 
channeled that message for me and put it out there and inspired me to understand that, you know what, whatever I'm feeling called to do, it's not just me fancifully thinking I want to do this again. It's also quite possibly something that's meant to be and that I will start doing again. And if you're a man, if you're a guy, then Jordan, I saw a post he made recently on Facebook. He has gotten certification in coaching and in NP, how does it go? NPR? No. NLP. Sorry, I'm bad with stuff that I haven't personally studied. He got certified in NLP and he's offering coaching for men who want to discover their passion. So if you're a guy and you're wondering, what is it that you're called to do? Check out my Facebook page. No, check out his. I'll put the link to the group he created in the video description somewhere below. Just check that out. I'm sure he can be helpful. And the reason I'm so confident that he will be is that he has helped me come to this breakthrough. So I'm sure he can help others also come to that breakthrough. And anyway, yeah, that's my big announcement is that I'm going to start doing tarot card readings again give me about a week and the next video that you see from me after today's draw with me is going to be a video relaunching my tarot passion about doing readings again i hope you resonate with this i really hope it inspires you to drop any guilt shame or self-punishment from mistakes that you may feel you've made, where we can now take the lessons we've learned and level up because of them. So with all of that said, I'm looking at the timestamp here, like 41 minutes and 40 some seconds in. That's when I'm going to say at the beginning of the video, if anybody wants to skip my huge spiel and just get to the drawing stuff, come to this point. So I'm gonna turn off the video camera now and get into my drawing. Much love, see you in the next video, bye. All right, so I decided instead of just getting straight into drawing, I'm going to pull a card as something that we can focus on today and to kind of get into the second half of what to talk about while I'm drawing. This beautiful deck, it actually came with a book called The Illustrated Crystallery by Maya Toll. I bought it at Dragon Space in Vancouver, a store where I used to work that is still quite possibly my favorite store anywhere ever of all time. You walk in and it feels magical because it's painted like a fairy tale castle. It's got like fake cobblestone walls and it's just beautiful it smells like incense like you walk in and you can smell the spirituality in the air they sell a lot of stuff made by local artists i used to sell jewelry that i made there like the bracelets i'm rocking today that i made actually all the jewelry i'm wearing today other than the rings and this bangle Everything else I made myself, including the earrings and necklace I wore in the first part of the video. Anyhow, yeah, it feels like it's ready. I've shuffled them up a bit and I'm turning over the top card. And oh no, it was right side up to begin with. The fundamentals of humanness. And what's so cool about this particular card is that instead of a precious gem that we may or may not have. It's an element that we've all got some of the crystal in this particular card is salt. So I'm going to start drawing. Actually, I'm gonna leave this drawing as it is and flip it over and start a new one as I talk about this card. So how appropriate and awesome is the message on today's card, the fundamentals of humanness. When I started this video by sharing what I felt like I had lost connection with in a cult, which is the fundamentals of being who I naturally am, who I'm born to be. And what's interesting is I've had that card come up before 
when I've pulled cards for myself. And what it refers to is the need to ground ourselves and to be at peace with the building blocks of what we are, the building blocks of our humanity. And of course, the human body contains within it so much water and so much salt. And that's why the figure pictured on the card is floating in water, like floating in salt water. You can imagine she's taking that beautiful bath. I just love the imagery, like it has such a floaty, mermaidy, under the sea vibe to it with all of the seashells and treasures and the fish and the dolphin. But when we take time to connect with ourselves and do like a ritual bath, if you pour yourself a bath and put in some scented salts and just relax and just let yourself float for a while, the worries and the stresses of life that kind of get imposed on you will start melting away. And salt is very cleansing and very healing. Like when you soak in a salt water bath, it pulls out any toxins that your skin is holding on to, and it cleanses you so completely. I love taking an Epsom salt bath. One of the ways I kind of recharge myself, if I'm caught thinking about the cult that I used to be in or if I find myself kind of worrying about life or about the future or what am I even doing with myself I'm 30 fucking six and I'm still living in an apartment like thinking of my mom owned her own house by now when she was my age I'm sure we all do this it can't be just me right please <laughs> but whenever I catch myself in that kind of a state one of the things they'll do is take a bath and I pour in Epsom salts and fragranced oils and just relax in that sweet smelling healing water. And it's just so rejuvenating. It, it helps me release any of the stress that I'm holding on to and remember what's truly important, which is fulfillment, creativity, living our passion, doing what we feel is right for the world. I, I've come to a place where I don't measure success by what stuff I've accumulated or what I have materially. I measure success by the feeling that I get at the end of the day. You know, today, did I do what I have in my power to do to make my life better and to make the world better for others? From the food decisions, like, yes. Still vegan, yes. Nothing that I ate today or purchased today has caused the enslavement, death, or suffering of an animal. That's a win. Like, if the only thing a person does is not contribute to all of the injustice in the world, which it's hard to avoid for some. The conditioning is so strong in so many that even just making a decision not to harm seems extreme or difficult. So if that's the only thing you've done, if the only thing you've done is not do harm, you're doing pretty good by earth standards. But anyway, yeah, that ritual bath, that sweet scented salt water soak, it's so healing. And a lot of us who identify as star seeds and who feel connections to lifetimes on other planets and in other celestial planes in places that are a little bit more harmonious than this one, higher frequency, a lot of us will feel as if our humanness is a mark against us. Like anytime we have a negative emotion, we'll think, I should be beyond this by now. I'm supposed to be evolving. I'm supposed to be past whatever it is that this negativity is happening in me. And that, ironically, 
is what holds us back, not the negative emotion or the negative situation. As long as we're physically alive in human bodies on earth, we are going to experience the occasional conflict. We're going to have a disagreement with somebody online. We're going to question ourselves and question the worthiness of our decisions. We are just, it's just gonna happen. That's what happens here in this world. It's not a mark against us. It's a sign that we're alive. Like, and we came down here for this. I'm going to talk a little bit about star seeds again, which is something I haven't done in a long time on my channel. But the the star seed vibe that I think a lot of you also have, it's very likely that you've been thinking about this. And that's why you've been drawn to watch my YouTube channel. That vibe of wanting to make the world more harmonious, wanting to raise your frequency, wanting to do something better than what generations before us have done. It's a good thing. It's a great thing. But it also sometimes feels like a frustrating thing because that change doesn't happen as rapidly as we think that it should. Like, I've heard from a lot of people, like other YouTubers who I watch who talk about their starseed awakenings and clients I've had in the past when I was reading tarot professionally before. But like I said, I'm so excited to start doing again. It's like, hello, old friend. That's, that's the feeling I get when I think about reading professionally again. But yeah, others have said, like, they'll have this incredible spiritual experience, this great awakening. They'll hear a cosmic voice. They'll intuit something. They'll just have a realization about who they really are. And it's temporarily so satisfying. It just makes them feel so excited about life again and so complete. And then the next day they have to go to school or they have to go to work or they have to see a relative who nags them a lot or just whatever. They check their email and life happens. And it feels like this great realization, this great awakening that they had becomes nullified. It's like, yeah, I, I heard the voice of a guide who told me that this great thing is awakened in my energy. Well then, why is this person still emailing me to complain about something I did? Or why do I still get yelled at by customers at work? Why do I still have to work this dumb job? Like if I'm so evolved, why aren't I being just taken care of by the cosmos? You know, we have this tendency to put more value into the things we don't enjoy than into the things that we do. I hear this a lot from influencers that if they get a hundred positive comments about something and one negative comment, instead of the people saying, good job, this resonates with me, I love what you're doing, give us more. The one person who says, you're such a fraud, this is dumb, I can't stand your, your annoying, stupid voice, like, just shut up already, that's the comment that they carry with them for the rest of the day, like, why does this person think that I suck? Even my mom used to tell me this, like, my mom's a retired school teacher, and she used to do, obviously, as every teacher does in the Western world, she would do parent-teacher interviews. And she said, like, 20 parents of the 21 students in her class would come in for interviews and say, like, my kid loves your class, you're her favorite teacher, or his favorite teacher, she's so excited to learn, he's improving so much in his reading skills, whatever. And then one parent would come in and say, why isn't Timmy reading at a fourth grade level yet? His sister did when she was his age. 
That other teacher must have been better than you. Pardon my parent voice, that's not really how I think parents sound, it's just whatever. But yeah, she said that it would be that one parent that would just ruin the night for her. And that's another fundamental of humanness, getting back to the message on this card. The fundamentals of humanness is that we value the opinions of other people. And sometimes that's a great thing because it helps us see things about ourselves we wouldn't see otherwise. And other times it's just so misleading and so damaging because instead of just valuing the opinions of everyone equally, we'll put more stock into the opinions of people feeding our doubts. Because fears are heavier than hopes. The things that we fear we're bad at, they have more weight, they're, they have more gravity than all the lightness that we feel we should work towards and that we can achieve. And so letting go of that attachment to the negative, that's something that can catapult us so quickly. Like, Something I've been talking about with some friends lately is part of the reason I felt like it wouldn't be right for me to start reading tarot cards again is that I've become so passionate about anti-cult activism and empowerment within the self, like the questioning those who impose themselves as authorities and examining the validity of statements people make, having more of a scientific eye when it comes to discerning what's right and what's wrong, the critical thinking. I, I got so passionate about that after realizing I had been duped by a fraud that I thought, well, a lot of the same wonderful experts, don't get me wrong, I value these people a lot, but a lot of the people who talk about this kind of stuff poo-poo things like tarot card readings, crystal healings, channeled messages, extraterrestrial visions or awakenings, like to them, that would be as bad or as stupid or as fake as cult leaders and the impositions they put on people. And so I vocalized this to one of my friends who said, yeah, but when a cult leader or an external authority who declares their authority over somebody else tells them to do something or gives them a message, the driving force behind that is the greed or the selfish desire to control somebody else. But when you started reading tarot cards, you started doing it for yourself and for your own spiritual awakening, and you didn't go public with it until you had that calling, until a reader in Vancouver discovered you and invited you to start reading in her shop. And so it wasn't something ego-driven of what can I get from people if I tell them this. It was more something intuitively guided that you did it for yourself, it was beneficial, and now you want to share it with others. And that really clicked. It's like I had forgotten that this was something that I didn't just jump into for the sake of earning money or becoming a so-called teacher or so-called leader. In fact, I don't think of a reading in any way whatsoever as telling somebody what to do. It's more just interpreting messages that I receive from divine guidance and vocalizing them. And if somebody wants to take them and run with them, great. And if not, that's also fine. That's good too.
And maybe I should talk a little bit about what tarot is to me and what the readings actually are because it's not predicting the future. The future is not set in stone. There is no script written for us that we're reading like actors on a stage. Life is changing in every moment. We have free will. We're not predestined to be any specific thing or to do any specific thing. Just like this drawing that I'm kind of making up as I go along. There was no design in my head when I sat down with my pen and paper and started doing this. When I made these loopy doop lines, I didn't think I'm gonna draw dark spiky things sticking out of them like stamens and flower petals. Like that just happened. It wasn't planned, it's just happening. And the same way our future isn't planned, it's just happening through our creativity, through our interaction with the world around us. When we make a mistake, like how these two lines didn't come to a point like those ones do, we get creative and find a solution to make them work anyway, just like this, like the same way an abstract drawing unfolds. That's how life unfolds. If I can't even predict the outcome of a drawing that I myself am making, there's no way I could predict somebody else's future. That's not how tarot readings or psychic intuition works. It's about seeing the various options that we have and then connecting with the different energies available behind all of them. It's hard for me to even put into words because it just comes naturally. It's just something I do. In fact, I think the next video that I make, I've seen a lot of YouTube tarot readers. I've done a little research about like how, how to update what I used to do and take it into this time period. And I see a lot of readers have established YouTube channels where they'll do readings. They'll do like three different readings in one video. And at the beginning of the video, they'll show you like three courses you can choose. It's like those make your own, choose your own adventure books that kids love. I think I'll do one of those as my next video. I'll do a reading for all of you and you can choose Choose your own path. Go to whatever timestamp feels like it's your reading calling you. Because far better than me explaining what a reading is would be to just show you what I do in my readings. I always start with the present and then move to the past and then look to the future because the present is where we are and it's where we're meeting. And from the present, we can look back and see the past influences on us. And from the present, we can gaze ahead and see what we want to step into. Yeah, I get excited when I think about doing these readings again. Yeah, the fundamentals of humanness are excitement drive, inspiration. In fact, I think I'm going to open the book that came with this deck and read for you the message that the author gives to that card because it's such a new deck for me that I haven't yet memorized the meanings of all of these cards. I'm going to stop and do that right now because... I don't want to leave that too long. There it is. Oops. Just look at how beautiful this book is. Sorry again about the shaky camera. I am planning to get a better tripod so that when I start doing readings, you'll be able to see the table and the spread in front of you. So yeah, it says salt. Before there were diamonds, emeralds, and rubies, there was salt. This ancient crystal was used as currency, building cities, trade routes, and new technologies. 
While you might desire moonstones or opals, only salt is so necessary that you are hardwired to crave it. Do you know the difference between what you desire and what your body and being truly crave? Salt asks. Can you put aside the glitter to feed your real hungers? To embrace and take joy in the fundamental building blocks of humanness and happiness. All salt originally came from the sea, whether an ancient inland seabed or the ocean itself. It calls to the sea of our blood, reminding us that without a foundation of salt, we are nothing. So yeah, soaking in that healing water, bathing in that primordial essence of what we all are. You know, even when it comes to biology, the history of this earth, the first living organisms, the amoebas lived in that salt water. And so it's like it's in our DNA, it's in our ancestral ancient memory to crave water, to crave the sea, to crave that salt ambiance. So what I love about this book, it doesn't just give you like a definition or an interpretation of the card. It also gives a ritual and a reflection, something to do and something to contemplate. So the ritual, historically, salt has been used to separate. It pulls liquids from meats and proteins from liquids. This process is called salting out. Okay, that my veganism rejects. I don't want to hear about salting meat, but whatevs. We can use salting out as a metaphor to help us release other people's emotions that we may be holding on to. This process is especially wonderful for people who work closely in another's emotional space, like a therapist or a coach. Add a pinch of salt when you're washing your hands or bathe in salt water. In this shower, you can fill a washcloth with salt and tie it shut. The salt will dissolve through the cloth as you scrub your body. You can also scent the salt with essential oil. One drop per handful of salt will do. That's what I do. To make this essential experience. As you rinse with the salt, imagine any sticky emotions being pulled from your body and flowing away with the water. It's cool. Like, even though it's been a few months since I had this card come up and it's been a long time, I must have kind of had a held memory of what this was because that's kind of naturally where the conversation was flowing as I was drawing which is that we hold on to the negativity of other people's emotions and projections and opinions of us and that taking that ritual salt bath frees us from being held back so that we can be the essence of who we are once again. So the reflection, the salt in your social circle. There are people in our lives who serve the same function as salt in our food. At a party, they'll introduce strangers, offering a conversation starter as they wend their way through the crowd. In their presence, discussions gently come into balance. People find humor even in a moment of hot disagreement, and personalities that might otherwise seem too brash or cloying are tempered and tasty. Often, like salt, we only notice these magical people in their absence. And it's asking, who is the salt in your life? Salt's relationship to flavor is multidimensional. It has its own particular taste and it enhances the flavor of other ingredients. Used properly, salt minimizes bitterness, balances sweetness, and enhances aromas, heightening our experience of eating. So yeah, that's an interesting contemplation to think of. Who is the salt in your life? Who, who makes the company of others seem more magical and more fun and more interesting and helps neutralize disagreements, enhances your feeling of who you are. Especially as we are in another lockdown where I'm living, it's interesting to think about times when I used to party and people who I used to hang out with. If I think back to like my early 20s, there were not weeks that like there wouldn't be a single day when I didn't spend some time with at least some friend. More my late teens than my early 20s. By my early 20s, I was an art student in Vancouver. But when I 
graduated from high school when I was 17 and then started renting an art studio in downtown of my hometown when I was 18. Every single day, I would meet friends for coffee at the cafe across the street from that studio. We would throw parties that went on from like Thursday night until Monday morning. There was constant stuff happening. There was always like a social scene to be a part of. And back then, I wouldn't have been able to fathom the loner energy I would be embodying in my 30s, like staying home. And not just because there's a lockdown, like quite frankly, the lockdown suits the lifestyle I was already living. Only going out when I've got a package to send at the post office, like some jewelry order. But anyway, as I read the meaning of that card, I could immediately think of a few friends who, when they would turn up at the party, you just knew that it was going to be a fun night, that people weren't going to get trapped in disagreements and that it wouldn't be boring. So yeah, who is the salt in your life? It's a fun thing to contemplate about. I would even take that a step further and contemplate on how you can be the salt in somebody else's life. How you can remind them of who they really are and encourage them to achieve what they want to achieve. And also being the salt in your own life. But yeah, getting back to the starseed stuff about the fundamentals of humanness and also the fundamentals of divine fifth dimensional higher frequenciness. When you feel like that human aspect of self is dragging you down and limiting your vibe and dulling that magic that you are remembering that that's okay like letting yourself be okay with the humanness and also remembering like the book et 101 i know i've talked about this book before on my channel because it's one of my favorite spiritual books it explains that a lot of people wonder, like, why don't aliens just invade already? Why don't well-meaning extraterrestrials come down and help us? Like, put an end to all the suffering in the world. And it explains a prime directive not unlike that which we would see on Star Trek, that they can't just invade. It goes against the galactic principle for higher dimensional beings to just come down and dictate to others. They can't turn earth into their own cult. They can't just come down and tell us we're doing it wrong and that we have to start living differently. The only way they can influence earth, literally the only way a higher dimensional being can make a change in our earthly reality is by becoming human. It's only if they take a human birth, live the human experience, suffer, cry, feel pain, feel put down, feel desperate, go through the education system, drink a little fluoride, realize that what they're eating is cruel and come out of it. It's only if they live what we're living that they have any right to say what we should do differently or what we should stop doing or what we should start doing instead. And so I feel like all of us who have that inner call or that inner yearning of, I wish some extraterrestrials would just come down and change this world. Guess what? You are <laughs> like, you are that extraterrestrial or higher dimensional being that you're yearning for. It's you you came down and you're going to change it. So instead of waiting for 
somebody else to come save the day? How can you become the salt of the earth? How can you become your highest possibility? How can you change what you want changed and do what you want done? I see a lot of activists, like I follow a ton of animal rights activists on social media, like Earthling Ed, like the Harry's brothers, I forget their first names at the moment, but those two British guys who are exceptionally well-spoken when it comes to animal welfare. Um, Mick the Vegan here on YouTube. Oh, what's his name? That fitness coach who's vegan and people shit on him a lot because he calls it like it is. Oh, I, I can see him and his wife in my mind, but I forget their names right now. But yeah, I, I follow a lot of influencers who are animal rights activists and feel so inspired by the fact that they are throwing themselves into fights and arguments online every single day with people who don't get what they're doing. But it doesn't stop them from doing it anyway. James Aspie. James Aspie and his wife. And I forget her name right now, but Nikki. Nikki Aspie. And their name's Paul. As soon as I say I don't remember somebody's name, it's like readings are already happening and existence is whispering those names into my ears so I remember to say them which is pretty cool. But yeah, I, I follow a lot of these people and get so inspired by what they're doing. And I think back to like when I first went vegan in 1999 and waitresses and restaurants didn't even know what the word meant. And now there's vegan aisles in Safeway. There's like a vegan section at Shoppers Drug Mart. Like there's vegan YouTube channels, like a lot of celebrities are vegan. It's a, it's a household word now, which it didn't used to be. If somebody goes vegan today, they've got like five different brands of vegan cheese to choose from if they want to make their own vegan pizza. So I, it's like, I feel like a lot of these people that we think of as activists, are star seeds. They've come from a higher frequency. They've had this indigo child energy. Like I'm I'm letting my full spiritual flag fly in this video today talking about stuff that I've been censoring myself from mentioning for the past year or so. But yeah, I think a person doesn't have to think of themselves as spiritual to be making a major spiritual difference in the world. I recently subscribed to Mayam, um, don't know how to pronounce her last name, Bialik, who played Amy Farrah Fowler on Big Bang Theory. I subscribed to her YouTube channel and was watching an interview that she had with Eliza Schlesinger, the hilarious comedian. Um, and it was interesting because I've watched a lot of Eliza's stand-up comedy. I, I'm a comedy fan, guys. Like, I love stand-up comedians. And a lot of Eliza's material mocks the feminine girly girls who are into mermaids and fairies and crystals and spiritual stuff. Like, I never take it personally or feel attacked because I know it's not everybody's thing. I know it's considered wacky or kooky or fantastical or stupid to a lot of people. And I'm okay with that because I love it anyway. But it was interesting in that interview, she was talking about chronic back pain that she had experienced, some kind of slipped disc. I forget what exactly her issue was, but she mentioned reading a book about pain in which the doctor had stated that there are a certain number of people in the world who will have that same exact back condition and not even know that they have it because they don't feel anything. And that when the people who do feel it as an excruciating, debilitating pain find out that there are others who have the same exact issue but who don't feel pain, for a large number of them, 
the pain will become manageable just by knowing that they don't have to feel it. And that fascinated the hell out of me. And then Maya mentioned that, yeah, she's been reading that same book and that it gets into a lot of mystical, spiritual components about life, that we can manifest health for ourselves and that we can create our reality. And I was all for it when their conversation went in that direction because I know she's a neuroscientist. I know she's got a PhD and therefore is very clinically minded. And so it's always exciting for me when I hear people who are highly educated and fit in with the matrix of reality that society has dictated as the only truth or the only way or the in, the only measurable, calculable existence. It's always so exciting when I hear that their minds are open to something more. And she had mentioned the work of Louise Hay, who is the founder of Hay House, and said that Louise Hay has broken down different pains that we'll feel in our body and what emotional aspects are at play that they're bringing to our awareness, why we have brought in this pain and what it's teaching us and what we need to realize in order to overcome it. And then she went all in and started mentioning chakras and energies and spirituality. And she said that she didn't tell Eliza about that book when Eliza had first reached out to her for advice about the pain because she didn't think Eliza would be open to the spiritual stuff. And then Eliza told her, well, I don't talk about this often, but I do identify as a spiritual being. And she said something like, my chosen pronoun would be spiritual but not religious. Like she obviously is hilarious. I think she said it differently than I just paraphrased it. She said it better. I mean, watch the video. Check out Mayim Bialik's YouTube channel and watch her interview with Eliza Schlesinger. They are two talented and wonderful women. But yeah, that also made me think, how many times in my own life have I had a conversation with somebody who's asking me my opinion on something or for help with something, and I avoid taking it in a spiritual direction because I don't think that they would be open to that spiritual connection. And then later I discover they're all for it and that it would have been great if I had mentioned it earlier. And I think that's kind of the tonality that the conversation between those two took was that once Maya realized Eliza was totally not only open to the spiritual angle, but that she wanted it, that that was something she's also into, they could connect on so much higher of a level. And then I watched her interview with Kunal Nayar, who played Rajesh Ramayan Kutrapali, and that was incredible and unexpected. Dude is a meditator and so spiritually wise that she actually said if he started a cult, she would become his first disciple which I would not recommend to anybody. Like, let this be clear. If Kunal Nayar starts a cult, don't join it. Like, <laughs> there's no such thing as a good cult leader. But if you want to listen to his realizations that he gained through meditation and the self-help journey that he's been on since being diagnosed with a panic attack and an anxiety attack and how he used spirituality to overcome those psychological difficulties check it out because it's really fascinating and enlightening and he he shared about having an experience of being in the present moment and the aha that came with it like the realization that we always exist in the present you can't not be present Presence is you. Presence is now. Presence is here. Don't look for being present. Look, you're present. 
he explained so beautifully how he was able to stop seeking when he finally had that epiphany that in every moment he's in the present and it's only a matter of deciding how to experience it, what to feel about it, how to be in it, that he felt that fulfillment and could relax and go past the fears. And he said something that I think really everyone who's a seeker or who has been in a cult or who has yearned to have the answers needs to hear. He said that after coming to this realization that he is always in the present, he has had his fears triggered even after that. He has had anxiety come up even after that. But the difference is he doesn't let those fears that get triggered or that anxiety that comes up condition his perception of himself as a present spiritual realized being and that realization it's not something that once you achieve it you're stabilized and you'll never fall back again because life keeps happening just like how i was saying you can be awakened to a star seed reality you can understand you're a spiritual being in a human body and then read an email where somebody is like shitting on your parade or go to work and get into a conflict with a boss or a coworker. Life keeps happening even once you realize the game that it is, even once you realize your true self within the illusion. Life keeps happening, but that doesn't mean your realization doesn't also remain. And when you've felt that present moment and you've integrated who you are with the reality going on in your life and you can understand the higher energies at play that doesn't mean you'll never be triggered again or you'll never be anxious or angry or sad or scared or whatever it just means you always know you'll come out of it again this too shall pass and he mentioned the buddhist principle of constantly say neti 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 not this not this it's not only buddhist it's also in sanatana dharma he referred to it as the buddhist practice but i am sure i heard this in one of the upanishads that when you're looking for the truth of your atman the truth of your being anything that you perceive as the identifier for you your gender, your socioeconomic status, your last name, your parents' profession, whatever might be used to describe who you are, that's not you. You're not your hair color, you're not your body weight, you're not your profession, you're not your bank balance, you're not your likes and dislikes, you're not your favorite food. Who are you? And when you start having answers to that question, who are you, come up, if you continuously answer those answers with neti, 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 not this, not this, not this, it is so liberating because you no longer feel attached to any of that worldliness that conditions you. Anyhow, it was a great conversation between the, the two of them. I started following him on Instagram and then I was really disappointed to see him post something promoting Satguru who I've heard from people who left the Jaggi Vasudev cult that yeah it's also a cult um so that's kind of too bad he's getting drawn to promote spiritual teachers who impose themselves as authority figures on the lives of so-called disciples. I, I can't really get behind that, but I do think a lot of what he said was really fascinating and worth listening to. So yeah, I think I'm going to end it on that note. And once again, thank you for sharing this journey with me. This was a different kind of video from what I usually do, but I think it's a good segue. 
sorry, I've been literally holding my tripod with like resting it on my arm throughout this whole video as I've been drawing. It's not the best system. I need to get a proper desk and a proper tripod that will clip onto something to show the desk view instead of balancing this on my couch. But anyway, I think for now it has served its purpose. And yeah, I think that was a good segue into my next video where I'll do a demonstration of what my tarot readings are like. And in the next video, I think I'll finally be on a platform where I can offer readings, meaning like one-on-one -on -one personal readings once again. And I'm excited about that. I hope you are too. I hope you're excited about what you're doing in your life. Let me know in the comments. If any of what I shared in today's video resonated or if you're working on something personal too. Um, if you're one of my pen pals, I owe you an apology. It's taking me longer than it usually does to write letters back to those who have written me letters because I've heard from some more people who have left the Nityananda cult very recently. They've been going through a lot of shit and they've been sharing with me a lot of really horrible things that that cult leader has done even since the last time I spoke about him and it gets pretty heavy and it gets a little all-encompassing so I've been spending a lot of my time when I'm not working on my Etsy shops I've been kind of focused on connecting with more of my friends who I shared that cult experience with as they wake up and get out of it. And yeah, that, that I don't mean to give you an excuse. Like, I haven't written to you because I've been so busy doing important stuff. Like, no, that's, that's not my intention here. But I, I feel you do deserve a bit of an explanation why it's taking me so long. Um, but don't worry. I am working on replies and I'm going to get those letters out this week meaning this coming week. I'm. It's Saturday as I film this, so the week that we're about to get into. Anyhow, yeah, when I get to the point that I'm blabbering at the end of a video, it's time to end it. I just noticed, though, how synchronous this is. The colors in this card are totally aligning with my ring and bracelets. That's always a good sign when... And they don't all look like that. Like, there's all kinds of different colors in this deck. Like, it could have been any of these. But it's always really cool when the colors you wear match the card that you draw. I see it as, like, a confirmation and a synchronicity. Anyhow, yeah, thank you for joining me on this journey. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And I look forward to catching up with you again next time. Much love. Bye for now.